to the Robin Report CEO Series. I'm S.P. Raj, Chair of the Marketing Department and direct the Snyder Center for Innovation and Professor of Marketing at the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University and proud partner of the Robin Report for this exciting forum. Today, we have Robin Lewis, founder and CEO of his namesake brand, the Robin Report, and Rick Caruso, CEO of Caruso. Rick is an innovator, highly successful business leader, philanthropist, and the pioneer in creating memorable experiences in retail centers that are based on experience and community. Rick is the visionary behind centers like The Grove in Los Angeles, which has become the poster child for mixed use spaces that bring people together to meet, celebrate, and of course, to shop. We'll let these two industry experts dig into the power of community and commerce and the future of the shopping center. We'll have a Q&A later, so please submit your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Robin, it's all yours. Thank you, Raj. And first of all, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Um, so Rick, before we get into our conversation, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I mean it when I say it would take me at least a thousand words to even poorly describe what you have created. So uh, here are some images we're going to go through. And, you know, as we're going through these, I ask our audience, do these look like shopping malls? <laughs> <laughs> or do these look like little communities or villages? Well, it's a no brainer, guys, because these are not mirages. And this is the future, in my opinion. The legacy and typical enclosed regional shopping malls today, and I've used this phrase before, they are dead men walking. So it's a terrible thing to pin on them, but I believe it. And they have been for some time. Their demise has only been uh, hastened by the pandemic. And Rick, as you know, I wrote an article about you titled Caruso, Community Creator. And it inspired. it was inspired by your keynote presentation on the big stage at NRF's big show all the way back in 2014. And when I say big stage, there are probably 20 to 30,000 people in that audience that you gave this keynote presentation where you made a very dark prediction about the suburban malls uh, that were developed in the 50s and 60s. You said in 10 to 15 years, unless completely reinvented, they will be a historical anachronism, a 60 year old aberration that no longer meets the public needs, the retailers needs or the community's needs. You then showed pictures of those antiquated malls and you asked the audience, does this look like the future to you? It's outlived its usefulness. And you also encourage reimagining a place quote, unquote, a bigger and richer concept than a store or a mall, a place to create a sense of belonging, hospitality, inviting, interactive. And during this rebirth, you stressed, and this is an important point, that the focus must be on what was always, what has always been and will always be what people want, social engagement and an inviting experience. I said in the article that you are a visionary who has actually delivered his vision. In fact, Vanity Fair calls your properties the main street of dreams. So Rick, uh, your deserved compliment aside, uh, in my opinion, it was well-deserved and I'm not over flattering here. I mean, everything I said. Anyway, so let's get into this, uh, Rick, when uh, did you start in your mind kind of imagining what you have created and, and kind of what was the mental process? And then, you know, what triggered the actual doing it? Well, first of all, um, Robin, thank you for having me. This is a great honor and privilege for me. Uh, you and I have gotten to know each other. And um, as I've told you, I wake up 
every morning and the first thing I put on and read <laughs> is what you have to say. So I have been a student of yours for a long, long time, and I love learning from you. So this is thank you so much, with you. and exciting to be part of Syracuse University and and all the great work that uh, that happens there. You know, this uh, started a long time ago. My company is about thirty years old. And um, it's really the basis of it is I love people and I wanted to be in a business and I love real estate and I love building things. And I started out uh, as uh, and it, buying an industrial building and I just didn't get very excited about dock high loading and clear heights. <laughs> I didn't see any people. So I quickly pivoted to retail and, and honestly, Robin, I had really no idea of what the rules were and that was one of the greatest benefits to me because I wasn't worried about breaking rules. What I had a good feeling of was what people wanted and what I enjoyed. And I really hope that what I enjoyed, people would too. But I think there's just these common uh, traits that we all have as humans that you mentioned, connecting and uh, happiness and feeling of community. And I wanted to build projects that that was the core and really dining and shopping were sort of ancillary to just coming and enjoying your time with your family and friends. So that's a great point about didn't want to break the rules, didn't want to live under the typical legacy rules of, you know, what a shopping mall is. That's, that's a terrific comment. So what, what um, comes first in this creation? Is it the lifestyle and experience you, uh, you want to create or envision? And then when, when and who begins to map out the shops and how many and what types, restaurants, entertainment, gardens, generally what is kind of the step-by-step -step process, uh, the roadmap to opening? Sure, good question. So it all starts with and gets driven by the community, the community that we serve around us. And when we go into a, a project, I personally have community meetings. I'm in people's living rooms and auditoriums and everywhere they'll have me. And we start out with a blank sheet of paper and we say, tell us what you'd like to have in your community and what you don't want to have in your community. And the reason for that is Robin, is that the community that we're going to serve knows so much better than we do what the demands and the desires are. And we want to really just give ownership of this project to the community we serve. So even at the Grove, you take a look at the Grove, it's a much more dense urban setting that really drives the design of it. We are connected to the old original farmer's market and we always start with the story and we literally put it into a book and everybody on the site reads the book to understand what they're building and what the premise of this is. And then once we have those building blocks in the community, then we start layering in the type of retail that we believe is the most relevant, is the most forward thinking and then we start laying in restaurants. Generally, what we always want to do is have a mix because we believe we're building the centers of town and the centers of town have a lot of variety. They have shopping, they have dining, they have movie theaters, they have bookstores, et cetera. And so we want to do a mix, but it really is driven by the community and they are the best advisors that we could ever get. And that's the way we've done every project we built, including the resort you know, that we built up in, in Montecito. How unique. I am, I am positive that a lot of other developers would maybe understand intellectually what you were saying, but none of them really do that. You know, your centers are connected by commerce, but the experience of building this community, having this community and so forth and so on, uh, people have visiting these places uh, seem to transcend shopping. It's, it's more, correct? How do you do it? So if you ask anybody in our company what we do for business, it's never about building shopping centers or apartments or anything else. What we do every day is we want to bring enrichment and joy to people's lives. So how do we do that? And we always start with creating these places that really are just joyful and pleasant to hang out in. You know, the parks, the landscaping, all of those kind of things. And as corny as this may sound, Robin, as a, as a grandson of an Italian immigrant that was a gardener, and I grew up <laughs> doing rounds with him in his gardening truck, I just have a love um, 
for grass and trees and water and, and beauty. And again, I think that's a common trait. It calms us. And the other thing I wanted to do on these properties, which was very different than when I sort of got into the industry and started hearing about the rules that I should be following. I wanted to increase the dwell time. I wasn't concerned about turning the parking lot as quickly as possible. I was concerned yeah. about keeping somebody there as long as possible, because if I kept them there as long as possible, they were going to spend more money with me. And I wanted to attract families because I knew if I would get the mom and the dad onto the property, you spend more time and they're going to spend more money and they're going to enjoy themselves. And we create this, what we call heart share. So every day we're working to build market share, but we're equally focused on building heart share, that loyalty that somebody has to our properties. And we're seeing that pay off in dividends now as we're coming out of this pandemic and people are coming back onto the properties and and really shopping very mightily with us, which is great to see. Fantastic. <clears throat> the, um, the heart concept is, is very interesting. I mean, it's, it's way beyond transactional. It is emotional, emotional connection. And um, I think that's incredible. You know, one of your great talents is to use the, the power of imagination and creativity outside of a conventional retail mindset, which you've just kind of been through here telling us about so but you have and you have worked uh, with disney imagineers in the past so who who do you tap uh on to to help you create these amazing settings uh, the best and the brightest that are out there that are willing to think big and the general rule has always been somebody that's never done retail before we hired, we hired designers that had never done a hotel before because i wasn't building a hotel I wanted to build a home that I was welcoming people back to. When I'm designing retail, I'm hiring people that are used to building parks and big open spaces and real streets and the rhythm of a street and how you sort of get that sense of scale that understands scale. The Imagineers are incredible people because no different than what I try to do in my company, I want to give permission and security for people to think big Make a mistake, doesn't matter, but just think big. When you think about the idea, Robin, of the Grove, I'll go back to the Grove again, just because it's so well known around the world. We're gonna build a trolley in the building of a shopping center. And we're gonna design a street with real curbs and gutters. And the trolley is gonna go about 1600 feet and dead end into the old farmer's market and come back. Yep. <laughs> Craziest idea, Yeah. right? And now that trolley literally carries more people per mile than any railroad in the state of California. And because of the crazy rules of the state of California, it's as actually licensed as a railroad. We have to run it as a railroad. But it's those kind of ideas that excite me. It has nothing to do with shopping or dining. It has everything to do with let's create a space that people want to come and enjoy. That's all, that all the drivers and yeah. then get the best in class, retailers, best in class restaurant trips and let them do their job. Put the customer in front of their door and they'll transact the sale. It's such a simple formula. Yeah. Yeah. In many ways, it's almost like common sense. You know, Blake Nordstrom once told me, he said, you know, I said, well, who do you, you know, what, what are the, uh, the uh, requirements to get hired as an associate at, at Nordstrom? He said, look, he said, we don't want retail experience. We can train them in everything about retailing, but we can't train them to be an empathetic, nice person. That's right. So it sounds like you get the same, the same principle. Yeah. So um, obviously your centers are not easy to replicate. In fact, I don't think anybody could by the other developers. Why is that? Is it just part of this whole process that you've just been talking about or there's some other things that they why they can't do it i guess they're stuck in those big buildings that they created in the 50s and 60s big yeah know. it's a good question robin and i don't i don't know and i really don't take any joy in beating up the indoor malls other than i think it hurts the whole industry yeah. when you have an archaic sort of set of rules and operations that don't meet the needs of people i mean 
it literally was designed at a point in time that no longer is useful. And I'm just surprised that they haven't decided to reinvent themselves. And I think probably the problem is, you know, they just frankly don't give themselves the permission to do it. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. But well, yeah, you know, it's I tell you, I think we're going to see this amazing disruption happening in retail. I think it's going to be very positive. Yep. And excited about it. And uh, there's going to be winners and losers. And, yeah. um, you know, our company is built for this moment. And, uh, and we're excited about the future. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> you know, all these mall developers, all the CEOs, most of them, 90% of them in the retail business, including the mall, they're smart people. They're intelligent yeah. people. And, uh, you know, when you in 2014, when you were in that stage and you made those dark predictions, uh, I didn't take it as an attack on them. I take it as what you just said. You're trying to lift the industry. You're trying to help maybe give them some ideas that they wouldn't necessarily have. So, um, so yeah, there, there were some smart people in the audience and they, they, you know, when they heard what you said, they probably agree, some of them probably agreed with your, your vision, but what do they do? Tear them down and start from scratch or repurpose them or just exit? Give me some of your thoughts on that. I, I think many of these properties, they need to tear down and start from scratch. You know, the, the, just the business model of it where you have two or three big anchors and then you have all the stores in between, you're multi-level, you're in an enclosed environment. Um, the, the premise yeah. of the indoor mall is convenience of shopping. People think it's weather. It was always convenience of shopping. You make one trip and everything is there. That isn't necessary anymore because of online sales. You yeah. have all the convenience in the world in your home. So I think you've got to break these things down. I remember years ago when I started again doing the Grove and I was talking to the Nordstrom folks who wanted to be there. And they gave me their typical deal that they get from mall developers. I said, you got to be crazy. Why would anybody do that? Why would anybody give you the land, give you a whole chunk of money to build your building and then not charge you rent? <laughs> and he said, well, you get your money from everybody else. And I, I said, that rule doesn't work for me. And we ended up making a, a deal that works for both of us. But again, for people that are in this industry, I really encourage them and the owners of the malls, just break the rules and follow yeah. the consumer, just follow the consumer and you will find a path of great reward. Yeah, I, I, I think that there may be a whole new young generation coming up that will obviously take the place of uh, industries across the board. Yeah. And they're, they're growing up having much more innovative ideas. They're much more expansive, they're young. And I, th I think I think we'll see it evolve into a better place. I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, so the continuing acceleration of online shopping, I guess we need to talk about that. It's turbocharged, obviously, by the pandemic. And it's, it's caused major declines in the sales of the retail shops uh, across the country and the physical brick and mortar guys. Um, but what about in your communities and do you expect, as many experts do, that the percentage of online shopping will continue to even grow post-pandemic? Some people are saying as much as 50%. Mm -hmm. So here's my thinking, and I've said this for years, Robin, about online shopping. It's the last thing that all of us in brick and mortar business should be worried about. Actually, we should embrace it. And uh, years ago, I was at the Milken Conference and I made this statement, the best thing that's happened to retail is Amazon. And it's proving to be true. One is because as an online retailer, they're innovative, they're focused on the customer, and they, they create um, new markets that have never been there before. And now what we see Amazon doing, like most every other great online retailer, is opening brick and mortar stores, yep. and reinventing the engagement that a consumer has in their brick and mortar stores. So I find it exciting. But here's the bigger issue for me. When we're putting together a retail project, I want the best and the brightest and the most successful retailer. If a retailer is going to be the most innovative and the best, they have to have an engaging and relevant brick and mortar store 
and they have to have an engaging and relevant and frictionless online. Yep. How that retailer makes the sale, I don't care. What I want is the vibrancy of that retailer on my property. So if somebody goes to Nike on one of our properties and looks at the shoes and goes home and buys them, and next time they go to the store and buy them, I'm fine with that. Yeah. And by the way, the greatest increase of growth of online shopping is buy online, pick up at store. And I love that because now they're on our property. And so we're engaging that, promoting that, working with the retailers to support that and make that experience of the guests going to the store to pick up even easier. And we can capture that in percentage rent, which I know so many landlords are worried about. But I, I don't worry about online at all. What I worry about more is retailers becoming stale and not being innovative. And, you know, you hit it this morning with your report on Ikea, on how they've evolved. And we better all be watching what Ikea is doing. And I agree with you 100 percent. It was a great, a great discussion you had this morning in your report. Yeah, Warren Schelberg wrote that. And he's one of our better writers, expertise in that area. He's a very well done. Home, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and the, you know the, the, the these yeah the, the <laughs> digital is going physical, and physical is going digital. I mean it's a huge, but as I've always said, I would rather be a physical going digital because the capital requirements and the time to take it, it is not as bad. To be a digital and go physical, right. it's a big challenge, right? And by the way, Robin, if you don't mind me saying this, because. You and I have been around long enough to remember this. The idea of multi-channels and selling a product is as old as dirt. Yep. You know, Sears had stores and Sears had a catalog. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, this is nothing new and it's really what you want to have in your retailers. Yeah. So uh, on this other subject, this is Zoom phenomenon, which we're here on right here, yeah. uh, working from home, working from home, a lot of a lot of people in the financial industry and so forth. Um, do you think it's going to stick? And what will that mean for commercial real estate? Ha ha ha! And will it have a major impact on your properties in any way? Well, I wish I knew. I wish I could predict the future on that. My guess is uh, that it's going to be a hybrid. We're going to have meetings in the office uh, when we can do it in a safe way, and we're going to have uh, meetings via Zoom and people are gonna work from home. I know that my employees, what we've told them is first and foremost, we wanna hear what they want. And then we're gonna to put together flexible options for people to go in the office and continue to be via Zoom. And it's gonna depend on the type of meeting and what needs to be discussed. I think for us, what I see, the pandemic with respect to all the tragedy and all the struggle and all the terrible things that happened it was also the biggest reset button in the history of mankind. Yep. Uh, every business had to reevaluate their business model and every human being had to reevaluate their values and their priorities, right? And again, I think that we are in the midst of the great human reconnection and desire to be out like never before. The isolation has worn on all of us. And so I think that retailers and merchants that are really great restaurateurs that engage the guests are gonna be rewarded hugely uh, over the next year and to go. I don't think it's gonna change. I think there's human behaviors that have changed for good. And if you're ahead of that and meet the customer where they wanna be, you're gonna be paid off with great fortune. Yeah, I agree with you. The pandemic was a great reset button probably the greatest reset button in history, as, as you mentioned. Yes. It's incredible. I mean, it's closed the whole globe down and we still aren't out of it yet. So, it, but so you're right. It will result in all kinds of different things that the, the new normal as they're calling it. Um, <clears throat> so Rick, what is your best performing property and why? Mm. Well, I, I would break it down uh, pre COVID and post COVID. You know, what What we see in um, pre-COVID, it was clearly the Grove and the Americana, just incredible performers and sales per square foot, the efficiency of the traffic, the conversion rate, the dwell time, all of the metrics. What we're seeing now in post-COVID as we're coming out of it, 
um, a higher conversion rate, a higher spend per person on the properties across the portfolio. But the properties that are out in more what I would call suburban areas where a lot of people have sort of migrated to, Palisades, the Commons, et cetera, have really come out very quickly uh, and strongly, which is great to see. The Americana is doing incredibly well. Um, and the Grove is growing quickly, but what we need to see is that traveler coming back because a big part of the Grove right. travel, you know, was the traveler. But, um, you know, the Grove and the Americana historically, but I love the model. I think the future model of retail is really Pacific Palisades, Palisades Village. Mm. Small, it's local, it's curated. We forced every retailer and restaurant to have smaller boxes, more efficient boxes. We have as many stores at the Palisades <clears throat> that we do at the Grove, yet the whole project of the Palisades can fit inside the Nordstrom at the Grove. Wow. Isn't that great? <laughs> Shopping experience is so cool because you have so many different shops and doors, but they're all curated. And I, I think localism is a big part of the future of retail. Oh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. You know, I've written, written about, about that. that. Yeah. For sure. Yep. And, um, and that also will spark, I think, a, a, a tremendous growth in, in smaller stores, in neighborhoods, and so forth and so on. And frankly, your villages, your communities fit right into that future. In fact, lead that future, which, you know, I've talked about and written about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on a, um, from a business point of view, do, your, do you and your teams have a regular review of what's going on and today and how you think things are going to be in the future? And do you evolve your properties accordingly? Yeah, so we meet on a regular basis. I meet weekly with all my department heads, um, you know, in a formal meeting. Obviously, we're talking every day about something. But we also, at least every two weeks, we have meetings just talking about new innovation and inventions that we want to put together. We're spending a lot of time right now with tech companies that we've made investments with so that we can, as I ask everybody to develop the human algorithm so that we can predict what all of us want in the future. We've got, you know, we have to respect and look back on historically what has worked, but then we also have to have the ability and the strength and the courage to be innovative and challenge that. And so my probably most important job is to continue to challenge people to think outside the box. And just because we did something a year ago that worked, maybe we should rethink it again. And, um, but we have constant meetings. We've got some new projects that I've told our team to really push the design on and push the thinking on. And that's, what's really fun is the creation side. Yeah. I love that the most. <clears throat> sure. So, yeah, you know, I just have to comment. You mentioned Grove and Americana. I looked uh, this up uh, with, and Yahoo Finance says the Grove clocks some 20 million visitors a year. And to put that in context, that's more than the Great Wall of China or Disneyland. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, they said the Grove yields over 1,600 per square foot, yeah. and Americana tops 1,100. I mean, that's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, you just kind of describe why. I mean, so it's not really a mystery why these two are doing great. And they're, oh, they're, yes, and they're in the top 15 shopping centers in the world. Yes. Incredible. Incredible. I have a great team, Robin. Yeah. I great think you team. Probably do. Everyday passionate. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a lot of young people? A lot mm -hmm. of people are next gens and stuff that are working with you? Absolutely. I mean, great. that's the key is build a bench. Yep. Smart, young, passionate people and um, give them a lot of freedom to go and run with it. And yep. absolutely, it keeps me, keeps me younger and, you know, and it's fun to work with, for sure. And they probably are able to guide you in your strategic thinking about the next wave of consumers who are going to be them, the millennials and the Gen Zs, which will shape your thinking process on uh, shops and restaurants and so forth and so on, right? Absolutely correct. And we're spending yeah. a lot of time thinking about the Gen Z and using a lot of our employees that are younger, to your point, to help fashion that, along with what kind of technology 
they want to incorporate as they're shopping or they're pulling into the parking structure. Right. Whatever it is. What kind of product and how they're going to spend and what their priorities are. I tell you one thing that I think is really important to me and all companies right now, especially with Gen Z and the millennials, they want to engage and patronize companies, patronize companies that have a higher purpose that are connected to the community that whether it's sustainability or whether it's racial diversity, whether it's giving back to the community, whatever that case is, that is so important to them. And it's something we've been doing for decades. But what we see right now is the shopper really wants to be with somebody that they believe have the same value system that they have. So understanding to your point, that future customer is very critical and it leads to good things, by the way. Yeah. Well, that, that purpose thing and the environment, all these things, that's another thing that is going to stick. And these young people are going to make it stick. And yeah. retailers that don't follow the consumer on that, the young consumers, they ain't going to get the business. That's and right. I've got my entire staff keeps pushing me to cover this kind of movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we're all, always trying to come up with the right kind of articles to do, do so. Um, we also have an innovators network where uh, Deborah is seeking out these young upstarts in, in, in the tech world to um, bring them into the Rob report. That's great. Yeah. So, yeah, so anyway, um, you, you, you talked about the heart share, the juxtaposition between uh, market share and heart share. Um, you pretty well described that, but yeah, go through that again, because I think that's extremely important. So like every company, you know, we're very competitive and, and we're obsessed with winning and we want to have the best and the biggest market share. But I think it has to be combined with hard share because hard share um, is an investment that pays off long after market share goes up and down. And hard share is all about loyalty, is all about a customer feeling engaged and good about doing business with you, wanting to be there, whatever that is. You know, when the pandemic hit in California was shut down and we were shut down tight and locked down, we made the decision to keep all of our properties open, perfectly maintained, open meaning you could walk through them because we're not an enclosed mall. The parks were beautiful. The flowers were beautiful. We sent out a letter to the communities, every community in Southern California we serve. The lights are on bright. The music is on. The fountains are playing come go for a walk and enjoy yourself in a safe place, whatever the case is. That's heart share. And the community was so grateful to be able to get out of the house and know that we're in an environment that was safe, right? Yep. And that investment <clears throat> pays dividends beyond any calculation. And it's just a core part of our company. And, and again, we're seeing that, that payoff and the payback now with I was at the Grove yesterday and it was just full of life and full of people and full of shoppers and everybody had their masks and doing the right things, but it was life. Yeah. They're there because they feel like it's their place. That's hard share. Yeah. You know, in my co-authored book, the new rules of retail, um, we had three principles for success and one was preemptive distribution, the other is value chain control, and the third, and, but actually the first was what we called neurological connectivity. So it's kind of a different twist on your heart thing. The, the, the thesis was the, 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 that when human beings, when people have a, an experience beyond expectations, it releases that chemical in their brain, dopamine, <laughs> and, and this, this with, with, with brands and retailers who provide this experience of beyond expectations, they're building loyal customers like crazy, yep. you know, and they're well examples. So anyway, and um, then I, yeah. I would add, if you don't mind, that's why brick and mortar retail will never go away. Yeah. Because the opportunity for a retailer, a brand to have that salesperson, which is really their brand ambassador that gives them the opportunity to engage that human being, that customer, that is so valuable. You, you know, so um, to your point, you walk into a restaurant and somebody says, Robin, welcome back. I've got the table that you like and the bottle of wine. Unbelievable. That I yeah. 
You're done. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah. I've, al- I've always said that common sense is often brilliant. <laughs> Period. You know, yeah. think about it. Yeah. So you mentioned this before. Can you give me a sense of what the average traffic rate, dwell time, and spend on your properties versus the traditional malls? Can you let us know? Well, I can't. I can't go into too many details because we try to keep that a bit proprietary, just because of our comp- competitive oh. side. But our dwell time on our properties is uh, close between about an hour and a half to two hours. It's a it's a long oh. time on average. Now it depends on on the property, and that's today without movie theaters operating. You know, in California they just reopened, but most of them haven't. Obviously, the movie theater skews a bit. Um, the spend on our properties across our portfolio post COVID is up 24% and the conversion rate is up 40%. Wow. So on average, our conversion rate across the portfolio has been about 90%, which is really remarkable that 90% of the people stepping on the property are buying something and they are buying something based on our intercept studies that we've done three times more wow. than the indoor mall. So they're staying longer, spending yeah. more money and converting at a higher rate. And, you know, that's a formula for success, obviously, for our retailers. Yeah. And there's no magic of, of why you oh. get, get those kind of numbers. Uh, so, Rick, by comparison to me, you're still a pretty young guy <laughs> and you still have most of your hair. Uh, anyway, I don't know. <laughs> do you have some other big... Um, creation ideas that you would like to share and you know what's what's your next move next move i mean how about building more communities across the country as i urge in my uh, article about you yeah listen we've got a and i appreciate the question we've got a big book of new developments um that that are starting we're adding more residential to our current retail properties in really great markets so we're converting what is currently a great retail property like the Commons of Calabasas and adding apartments so it's going to be mixed use, which is going to be great. The efficiency of that, the profitability of that is enormous because of the sharing of expenses and operations. Uh, we're doing the same in Westlake Thousand Oaks. We're looking at doing the same thing up at the Miramar Hotel that we have in Montecito, adding apartments. Um, the, the thing that I'm also really excited about is we've secured a lot of real estate down in Marina del Rey along the waterfront. We probably have the most frontage now of any single owner down in Marina del Rey. And we, we bought a marina down there. So we're in the boat business, the boat docking business. And we're having a lot of fun reinventing how we engage along the waterfront and reinventing uh, how people dock their boats and how people can go from their boat to restaurants, to shopping and living and and uh, in the, on the water. So we got a lot of good things going on. Going outside of the, the region we know, for me, makes sense. And I appreciate your encouragement. If it's an existing project that we can go reinvent, because the ground up development side of the business, I think you really need to understand the community that you're serving. And if I go into a new town, I'm I'm not going to know it as well as the local developer is going to know it. Um, And to be able to get the entitlements, that's really one of the great things we do is we want to go into areas with very high levels of barriers and build something that other people couldn't get entitled to create a lot of value. Um, So I think we're going to stay more local, but what we are looking for in other areas around the country are existing projects in really great communities that we can come in and buy bring our team and our skills to it and then reinvent it. And we've got interesting team flying around the country looking for opportunities. Well, would some of those be the so-called a malls that, that you don't own? You know, we are looking at malls. Yes. Um, to reinvent. I them. mean, the open, the open, you know, open well, ones, not malls close. Can... we're not looking at close, but yeah. we're looking at open ones. And as you know, there's going to be a lot of those properties on the market. Yep. And um, I don't think there's one single buyer left anymore. 
for those. So it gives wow. us an opportunity, yeah. hopefully, you know, to select some really good ones and then reinvent them. Well, this is, you know, you know what you've done is tremendous. Um, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I guess <laughs> I hate patronization. So I, I'm honest with you, I'm not patronizing you. I mean, this is a wonderful story. It really is a wonderful story. And quite frankly, Rick, um, you know, I don't know if a lot of people in our industry, I mean, the major, major players know exactly who you are and what you've done, but there's a lot of people that don't. I mean, you're not a you're not a uh, big showman. You're not out there to get a lot of publicity, but um, you, you've done tremendously, and I'm you know, I really appreciate and am honored that you were here. So I, I, we do have a little time left, and um, I'd like to open that for questions from the brilliant students of our wonderful collaborator and partner, the Whitman Center at Syracuse Syracuse University. So. And here's Shelly, who I don't know if you met, but she also teaches at Syracuse and she's our chief strategist at the Robin Report. So she's gonna handle the questions. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Hi Rick, what a pleasure listening to all the great things that you're doing. Um, as Robin said, I'm an adjunct professor at the Whitman School of Management for Syracuse University. And our students are very smart and bright. So I have lots of questions. I'm not sure we'll get through all of them, um, but let's start with um, a couple questions from my students in the class that I'm teaching. So one question was about what changes do you see looking forward into real estate in terms of how deals are being structured as a result of COVID-19? And what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced with tenants? throughout the process of COVID-19? Well, it's a good question. And thank you, Shelley. I'm honored to be here. And Syracuse is a great university. So congratulations on, on your class there. There's the obvious things that are going to be that are part of negotiations now. You know, retailers and restaurateurs wanting a provision in the lease that if there's another government shutdown, they have a right to stop paying rent or reduce rent or things like that, right? And, and so you work through those kind of things. There's going to be a lot of changes in insurance provisions on how your income stream is insured. And there's going to be, unfortunately, a lot of lawsuits with insurance companies as to whether losses in the pandemic uh, are going to be covered. But I think what I would recommend to, you know, your students is, is think about really the future of retail and how retail product is going to be delivered through a multi-channel basis and how you can capture in your lease um, the value of that sale, whether it's bought online and delivered at your store or it's bought at the store and how that transacts. But I think what you have to recognize, which we recognize, many of the brick and mortar stores are gonna have a different purpose. And it may be the purpose is more of displaying a product. So how you value success of that store is not going to be over a single metric like sales per square foot, right? So if you could have a Nike store on your property and they didn't do any sales out of that, would you reject Nike as your tenant? And my answer would be absolutely no, you wouldn't reject Nike as your tenant. You'd encourage them to be there, but you would have to have a different formula for success. So I would keep a very close eye on what you're seeing in the retail world. I'd keep a very close eye on what Amazon is doing in the retail world because they are really going to be changing the guest experience inside some of these new formats that they'll be announcing soon. Great, thank you. Um, the next question we have is specifically about some of the challenges that the pandemic brought to the Grove and also during the time when the pandemic was serious you know, how do you overcome some of these difficulties? You obviously don't change the business model, but how do you kind of, you know, transcend the, the issues that you're having and kind of bring it back? Well, I guess I would respectfully differ with you. I think you do challenge your business model. Um, one of the things I would tell you about the pandemic for us, and again, this is out of, with full respect of all the struggling and the tragedy of the pandemic from a business standpoint, it gave me and my senior leadership team to do some things that we didn't think we could ever do, which is take a look at our business model and lean it down. 
and we leaned it down significantly mm. uh, to be more efficient that the ratio of our top line of NOI to our cash flow changed dramatically because how we changed job descriptions, authorities, staffing levels. You know, we did other things. When everything was shut down, it gave us permission to go onto our properties. We expanded every outdoor patio. We knew that outdoor dining has always been popular. It was gonna be more popular. So the capacity of the restaurants outdoors was now greater than what they ever had indoors. And they've really benefited from that. So the pandemic, the biggest challenge we had is you've got a business that's running at 100% and the next day it's zero. We were shut. And all of your operating costs remain. And there is not a case study, at least before this, on what to do. But we immediately went into action and looked at every operating expense, every lever we could pull, everything that we could change in order to take what was going to be a significant projected loss in terms of net cash flow and reverse that. And we actually ended cash flow positive through one of the most, I think, difficult years in business. And that's all to the agility of the team I had. Let me give you one more example. We have movie theaters that were closed and we have parking structures that were empty. And the team immediately did drive-in movies on the top of the parking structures. We did 55 <laughs> of them during the pandemic. Great. Every one of them was sold out and generated millions of dollars of income. So you just got to be innovative. That's great. And I congratulate you and applaud you for keeping that innovation mentality in your company. Um, what, would, what advice would you give to young aspiring developers of next-gen retailers? Um, break the rules. In fact, maybe don't even learn the rules. Uh, you know, fo follow your instincts, follow your intuition, watch people, be a student of people. I, years and years ago, I met Steve Wynn just randomly. And I said, give me the secret. He said, be the customer, be the guest and, and live it. And um, I think they're, like I was saying to Robin, there's basic things as human beings that have never changed. Human beings you want comfort, they want safety, they want connection, they want joy in their life. If whatever business model you provide, whether it's serving coffee or it's opening retail centers, if you connect with that human being in a genuine way uh, and you love that, it's going to come through and you'll have a successful business model. Great. Um, the, another question is, are there any centers in other countries that really aspire you or are there any that you think are doing a really terrific job? Well, I think in the United States, listen, Ball Harbor down outside of Miami in Ball Harbor is a phenomenal uh, property. It's owned by a great family. It's been there for 40 years and it continues to be the leader of retail in that region. Um, this is what we do. Anytime we're embarking on a new project, obviously pre-COVID, we go around the world and we study cities and streets and we watch how people use them. Literally down to the height of a curb and the rhythm of lampposts and the rhythm of trees. Um, wow. Because we all have five senses and when you step onto one of our properties or you step on a great street, you may not be able to describe what makes you feel happy there or comfortable but your, your mind is, is taking in all of that, what you smell, what you see, what you touch, what you feel. And that's what we study. And um, it, we don't, we also take the time to study properties that don't work and why they haven't worked, uh, equally important. And we travel around and do a lot of that. But, you know, I, I think Highland Park in Dallas is a great property. I, like I said, I think Ball Harbor is a great property, but I really get inspired by main streets and small towns and, and places that have stood the test of time that have remained connected with people. And a lot of the, the East Coast we love. And of course, some of the villages in Europe are spectacular, but we go everywhere. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you to get your crystal ball out. Uh, the question here is, when do you think the country will ba bounce back to a level of confidence to trust and really reinvigorate the retail industry? Well, I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, 
I think we're on our way there. You know, we're starting that we're starting that process right now. I think 21 this year is going to be a year of transition. Um, I think there's going to be significant growth because there's so much forced savings. You know, the estimate is $1.7 trillion of forced savings that's going to be unleashed. People are going to want to go out and spend. But I think, you know, by the time we get back to full swing, I think we're going to be into 22 and, you know, we're going to get into a normal cadence. Um, COVID isn't going to go away. We're going to start getting regularly vaccinated to deal with it, right? And we're going to change our behavior a bit, you know, to manage through it. Um, so I think it's going to be a transition this year and probably into 22, we'll be back into a normal swing. But that doesn't mean that great things aren't going to happen this year. We're seeing that now. And we just all have to have sort of a shared responsibility of how we go about our life and realize that we want to protect each other and get vaccinated and and then go out and enjoy life again. I think we're going to have a big year in 21, though. That's great news to hear. Um, one last question for you. And students always want to learn about, you know, your the best advice that you've ever received. Mm. The best advice I've ever received um, was from my my father, who was my best friend uh, since passed away. But he really encouraged me to do what I loved. He had a business of his own and uh, he never put any pressure, although I knew he wanted me to be in his business. Uh, he never put any pressure on me to do that. And when I told him as I was practicing law that I wanted to get into real estate, he said, just go do it. And um, I know that sounds corny and so simple, but if you wake up every day doing what you love, you will always outperform your competition that's waking up every day and really doesn't do what they love. And, uh, and it just makes life a lot more fun. So follow, I mean, literally, everybody's got some certain passion inside of them. And the students, I think, that have the ability and the permission to do that um, are going to be the ones that really will be the innovators and change the world. That may be the most important point of this entire hour. Shelly, your students, you know, that, that, you know, do what you love and success will follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, again, common sense and simple, but, but real, very real. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're running out of time now, Shelly. Yes, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank okay. you so much for answering our student questions. It's so meaningful to have them here directly from you. So thank you for that. It's really been a privilege for me, Shelley. Thank you very much. So Rick, it's a, it is a wrap. Uh, and as I said before, I'm really honored to have had uh, this time with you and hope that we can uh, continue to stay connected particularly after this pandemic lifts. I'm going to come out there and visit you. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks again. And also a big thanks to um, our audience, students, and our partner, the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse. And Raj, thank you very much. Um, and Rick, thanks again. Take care and keep doing what you're doing. It's great. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Very you, Robin. insightful. It's an honor. Robin, I love spending time with you. Thank you Great. so much for including Come me. to New York, too, when it's all over. I am. I'm ready to go, believe me. <laughs> can't wait to have a meal with you. Great. Thank all right. you. Well. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Bye. Bye-bye.